No, it's Damascus. <laughs> okay. Let's turn to number 371. Let's stand to sing all three verses. Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth alas for me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my ears that I may hear voices of truth ascend as clear. And while the wave notes fall on my ear, everything falls will disappear. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God thy will to see. Open my ears, illumine me, Spirit divine. Open my mouth and let me bear gladly the warm truth everywhere. Open my heart and let me prepare love with thy children. Tonight we continue our studies in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 9. We'll be looking tonight, the Lord willing, at verses 10 through 14. Very important passage because it helps us to understand many times the way in which God calls us and assigns us to do what we think to be a rather nasty job, things that we'd rather not be doing. And yet God in his wisdom chooses for us to do those things. And so tonight it is when God gives you a nasty job to do. Before we begin, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for all the things that you do give us to do, the responsibilities, the obligations, the things of joy, as well as the things that are sometimes difficult for us to swallow. And Father, we pray for your blessings upon the going forth of your word tonight that it will not return void, but that it will accomplish the thing which you please, and that it will prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you recall last week we looked at blind and dead before resurrection, and we saw the young man Saul, later to become the apostle Paul, going blind, and then being brought into the city of Damascus, where he spends three days neither eating nor drinking. His question had been, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? As soon as Jesus revealed himself in the Shekinah glory, Saul's immediate response was, I will obey whatever you want. How unlike us that is when God calls us to do something that we don't particularly want to do, and it's very difficult to do. We're blind, very hard to do a job when you're blind. You have to have special training and uh, things that perhaps we don't want to recognize, which we've suddenly been jarred into recognition of, as Saul was with our Lord. And we find him for three days fasting. Three days, he's blind. We find that God gave him a direct answer to his first of the two questions, I am Jesus. The second, what will you have me to do? He got an indirect answer, 
Go to town, somebody will tell you when you get there. No more specifics than that, just obey in the little things, and then God will reveal to you the big things and how true that is in our own lives. We need to learn to obey in the little things, and then God will give us direction in the big things. God is in no hurry to answer our questions. God is under no obligation to answer our questions. Some of our questions are not timely. We're not ready in some cases to have our questions answered. Sometimes God uses our questions to make us ponder on his nature and character as we sit and wait. Sometimes God uses our questions in and of themselves to open doors in our understanding as we ponder on his word. Sometimes God delays his answers to make us more ready and eager to hear the answer and not just to take him and his direction for granted. Sometimes God delays his answers because he's working in the heart and life of someone else, as we find in this passage, whom he will use to answer the question. God uses people. And sometimes, although we've asked God the question in advance, and there will be an answer coming, God is also working in someone else because God uses people to answer our questions. And so that brings us to our passage tonight, which is verses 10 through 14. I'm going to begin reading at verse 8. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Can you imagine if he had been doing this journey on, him, on his own, all by himself, and suddenly, in the middle of the road, he is struck blind, and there is no one else there who knows him. No one else who will help him. Even the very fact that he had taken along henchmen with him to capture Christians, God used the henchmen to help him out of this situation. That's the mercy of God. Many times God uses unbelievers around us to help us in ways that we never, ever anticipated. I can think of various times that I've been broken down on the road and someone has stopped and given us help, either with changing a tire or in one case when I, uh, the drive shaft, the U-joint on the drive shaft fell apart. Uh, God just brought people along to help us. And you know, here we find a situation where there's someone who is along with Saul who helps him and God doesn't have any special plans for them. God chose one man out of a group of men to give him blindness so that he might give him sight. To bring him up short in the middle of his life so that he might redirect his path. We know nothing else of the others who were with him. They disappear from the pages of history. Perhaps the Lord will let us know someday, but as far as scripture is concerned, the only purpose for them being along on that trip, from God's perspective, was for that last few miles to the city of Damascus to make sure that Saul got to a specific location where God had a divine appointment for Saul. It's fascinating, isn't it, to see how God uses even people that were perhaps headed on a wrong journey to direct our paths to a divine appointment. And so we see it happening here. <clears throat> and there he was for three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias! And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And as seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. A number of rather interesting things leap out at us as we look at the text tonight. Isn't it interesting that the house where Saul was staying was a house owned by a man named Judas? 
I don't think that's accidental. There is nothing accidental in the plan of God. There had been a disciple who defected, named Judas. Had Judas not defected, though indeed he was appointed to the destiny that God gave to him, and has his own special place in hell, in Tartarus, as clearly illustrated in scripture, yet you wonder if God had chosen not to have Judas betray our Lord Jesus Christ. What could God have done with a man who was clearly a very talented man? Clearly a man who, who had great financial skills. How often the church wishes for people who are rich and people who have financial skills and people who know how to keep books and make money. And But there was a Judas who died and went to hell though he had had close contact with Christ. Now here's another Judas. He owns a house in a Gentile city far from Jerusalem. And somehow there is a connection with Saul. Because that's where the men who are traveling with Saul bring him. We don't know if they stayed in the same house. We don't know if they went somewhere else. But they brought him to a specific location, which probably was not accidental. Perhaps Judas was the contact point in Damascus who had been checking out the believers there, which would have made it even more dangerous for Ananias to go into his house. Perhaps Judas was sympathetic to the cause and was known to the priests in Jerusalem as a place where Saul could go sort of as a safe house while he was scoping out the situation. But he's in the house of a man named Judas. There is information going both ways, as we see in this passage, too. Not only was Saul taken to a place which Saul would have been comfortable in, someone who knows what's going on and is sympathetic to Saul, but we discover that there's also been some spy information that has been transferred to the other side. Because Ananias says, I have heard by many of this man. I know something about him. I know how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. I even know, and this is something that must have come by speedy courier because Saul was traveling the road right after he received authority from the chief priest. Ananias already knew that Saul had gotten authority from the chief priests, and he already knew that Saul was on the road to Damascus. Here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Ananias already knew it. There's a lot of flow of information, and there's no internet, there's no telephone, there's no telegraph. There was some kind of a probably speedy courier post that the Christians had set up whereby young men from Jerusalem, when they found out through whatever inside sources they had there at the Sanhedrin, they would immediately warn the believers in the far distant places where persecution was coming. You know, we find that uh, David, when he's fleeing from Saul, had two such young men, Jonathan and Achimahaz, they were the ones who were carrying messages, sneaking in and out of the city of Jerusalem so they would let David know what was going on. Something of that sort, we don't know precisely what, but something of that sort clearly was going on here in this passage. Because Ananias, as he responds to Christ, doesn't say, okay, sure, Lord, I'll be happy to go. Who is this guy? Ananias already knows who he is. God made sure that Ananias knew because God was going to give Ananias a test of faith over fear. Your people, many times God lets us know certain things as we either read the newspaper or as we listen to the radio or those of you who have televisions, watch your television, or get messages over the internet or a letter from someone who is at a distant point but who has suddenly pertinent information. We get this information 
And it causes us to tremble, to worry that perhaps something bad is about to happen in our country. Listen, we know that from the Bible. We know that when a country goes a certain way, that God will send his judgment. That's why we pray for those in authority over us. But Satan wants us to have a spirit of fear rather than of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so we get these vibrations out there that make us feel a little bit worried. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? What will happen to my bank accounts? What will happen to my house? What will happen to me if they find out that I'm a Christian? Ananias had forewarning because God was going to give him a nasty job to do. Just a few of those things as we look at the text. Now, as we look at the nasty kinds of jobs that are out there and the nice kinds of jobs that are out there, there are at least four different categories of jobs that God gives his people to do. There are two positive categories, and there are two what we might call negative categories. The first positive category are jobs that we enjoy from the very outset, jobs that we never get tired of doing. Those include jobs, for example, that are easy, jobs that are short and varied, jobs that stimulate and satisfy our emotions, jobs that have mental satisfaction, jobs that enable us to express our love and appreciation for people that we love and, and that move those whom we love to respond in reciprocal love and appreciation. There include jobs that give us power over others, jobs that use our obvious talents and skills like a concert pianist. Jobs that pay well. All of us like those kinds of jobs. Jobs that pay well. Jobs that don't really take any work, like lying on the beach and watching for slowly approaching enemy blimps. Jobs that have honor and prestige, like being the president of a university when you only have a high school diploma. Jobs that are fun, like going on a three-week cruise to the Bahamas to write a one-page report on how good the food tastes. Jobs that don't take any time away from our other fun things that we would rather be doing. Jobs where we set our own hours that have no completion deadlines so we can lie in bed or watch TV. Those are the kinds of jobs that we like. And you know some people have jobs like that. You know some people like that. Those are, those are the kind of jobs that everybody would love to have. Of course, if everybody had those jobs, nothing would ever get done. We'd still be living back in the Stone Age. The second positive kinds of jobs are the jobs that we wish we had that other people do have. And it would include jobs in all of those different categories that we've listed. The third area are jobs that we are glad that other people have. And most jobs in the world fall into this category. Jobs that are dull, like counting widgets in a warehouse to ship off to Nepal. Repetitive jobs where you push the same button 40,000 times a day. Mindless jobs, like watching a machine for eight hours a day just in case it breaks down so that you can push the stop button. We don't like those jobs that other people have that are hard manual labor jobs and sweat jobs like digging ditches and filling them in again. We don't like jobs with miserable pay even though we've spent years and thousands of dollars training to do something else. We don't like jobs that make other people mad at us like being an IRS collection agent. We don't like jobs that nobody notices or cares about. We don't like scary jobs, like changing light bulbs on top of high-voltage towers in the middle of a lightning storm. We don't like jobs that ignore our skills and training. We don't like jobs that don't seem to have any purpose to them. Then we got the last category, and this is where Ananias falls. Jobs that we wish we didn't have to do, but we got assigned to do them anyway. And you know, most of the jobs that are in that third category of all the jobs that other people have that we don't want, it's the jobs in that category that frequently God assigns to us for specific reasons. He chooses us. Out of all the people that are on the face of the earth, he chooses us. We don't know how many millions of people or billions of people lived at the time of Saul and Ananias. But God made a choice. Out of all those billions of people, he chose one person to do a nasty job. A very specific person. He chose a believer. That's where God places most of his job responsibilities, you know. 
is with believers. And there has to be somebody who does it. And oh, how we pray that it won't be us. Perhaps Ananias had not thought about it in advance. Perhaps he'd not thought, man, I sure hope God doesn't give me a nasty job to do. But one day the Lord appeared to him in a vision and gave him a very difficult job. It was a scary job. It was a job that he, of all the jobs in the world, that's probably the one job he didn't want. Dear people, are you open to what God wants you to do? Ananias appears to be open when God first speaks to him. But then when God gives him detailed directions, he begins to bulk. Now as we look at the jobs in these latter two categories, when they're assigned to us by God, they're for purposes that go far beyond our personal desires and goals. And there are at least seven different areas in which, when God assigns you a nasty job to do, there are at least seven different areas in which God has something going on. First, God gives jobs that God uses in developing our character. Oh, how difficult that is. But you know, we're not born with a perfect character. We're not born sinlessly perfect. And God's design is to develop in us the character of Christ, which is perfect obedience to the Father's will. That's the first area when God gives you an nasty job to do. The first thing to take into consideration, ah, uh, God is working on my character to develop it into the character of Christ. The second thing, jobs that God is using to accomplish his purposes that are currently unknown to us. You and I have the value of hindsight. You and I can see what's going on around us in the present tense, but apart from the revealed word of God, you and I do not have insight into the future. You and I do not know what tomorrow specifically will bring. You and I do not understand what will happen a week from now as a result of actions that we take today. And yet there is, in the mind of God, the exact tracking of the course of history future, not merely history past. And God places us on a track which will interact with others in such a way that he will direct the future. Are you aware of that? Suppose you're working at a job in a ministry that does not seem to be very useful in and of itself, and yet you do not know how that job, through one small thing that you do, will have an impact on somebody who may, in the future, give to that ministry in such a way that the gospel is spread in a new part of the world. I think of those of you who work with the mission boards here. Just recognize that sometimes God brings things into our lives to fulfill purposes that we don't know about or that he only gives us a hint about. God gives a hint to Ananias. I'm going to show him how, much, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. But God doesn't tell Ananias the full scope of the plan. God doesn't tell Ananias the scope of the plan for Ananias or for Saul. And he certainly doesn't tell Saul at this point. But God has a purpose that he will accomplish when we learn to obey in the little things. Number three, jobs in which God is proving that he can use the most inadequate instruments for the most incredible ends. Tell me how much you know about Ananias. Do you know anything about him from this point on? Do you know anything about his childhood? Do you know anything about his parentage? Do you know anything about the jobs he had? Do you know anything about his wife? Do you know anything about his kids? Do you know anything else that he did in his life? God used an insignificant instrument as a fulcrum, as a turning point, 
to change the history of the world. God delights in using small and insignificant and inadequate people to accomplish his incredible ends. Number four, jobs in which God will receive the glory, not the man who is used to do the job. That's clearly the case here. It's a job where God receives the glory, not Ananias. Ananias proves that he has feet of clay by the way in which he speaks with God himself. Sort of like Moses. But we know a lot about Moses. We don't know a lot about Ananias. Moses argues with God. Ananias argues with God. God uses Moses and we see great things with Moses. God uses Ananias and he fades from the pages of history. Number five, jobs in which God is teaching us faith and obedience. That is, how to overcome our fears. God is teaching both Saul and Ananias faith and obedience. He tells one man to arise, go, and sit. He tells another man to arise, go, and place your hands. Both of the men end up doing what God wants them to do, and as a result, we have great blessing and power that then spreads to the church. It's interesting that both of them, both the commands, begin with the word arise. As long as you are sitting and doing nothing, you are totally useless. The first thing we have to do is get up and get moving in the direction that God tells us to move. He may have us wait for further instructions, but we must obey the first initial command, which is to get up and get moving. When we fail to obey that, nothing else happens. Saul's bones would still be somewhere on the road to Damascus if he had chosen to sit there and feel sorry for himself. Ananias' bones would be there somewhere in Damascus if he had chosen to disobey. God would still have gotten his purpose done, but the bones of Ananias would simply be there in Damascus, a testimony to disobedience. Number six. Jobs in which God forces us to interact with other believers whom we would rather avoid. Jobs in which God forces us to interact with other believers whom we would rather avoid. Ananias would rather have avoided Saul. He wanted to avoid him because he was scary. He wanted to avoid him because, after all, Saul was a bad guy. He wanted to avoid Saul because of what Saul had done to other people. How many times do we choose to avoid somebody who doesn't look quite right to us? We've had a number of visitors in the past here, and they've sat in different parts of the auditorium. And at the end of each sermon, you know, I always say at the end of the prayer, you know, thank you for coming and please greet your neighbors. And I have noticed very frequently, in fact, almost always, that the people who are visiting are avoided like the plague. Nobody goes over to them. Now, I normally go down this side and I go over there and I start shaking hands and work my way down because most of the people sit over here. Interesting to me that oftentimes we have visitors that sit over there. I see people from here in the center section moving over toward this way and people moving this way and congregating and visitors sitting alone. Nobody moves toward them. We had an older couple, visited those seven, eight months ago, sat right back here, this center section, near the back of this first part of the center section. After the service, nobody went over to greet them. Nobody. There are 50, 60 people here. Nobody. So rather than going this way, I went down this way because they stood there 
waiting for someone to greet them. So I greeted them, discovered the man was an engineer, came from Virginia, had long-time old connections with the church. I had to go around and pull some people over and introduce them before anyone greeted them. Dear people, do we wonder why people don't stay? Jobs in which God forces us to interact with other believers whom we would rather avoid. Number seven. Jobs in which God is planning a spectacular reward for the man who does the job. We know this theologically from the doctrinal epistles, that those who have run a good race and fought a good fight, when they are finished with their course, they will receive a reward which the Lord has laid up in store for them. How many times do we cast away the rewards that God gives to us? They are there, they are ready for the taking, but we will not take them because we refuse to obey to do the job that God has set forth in his word. You don't have to get a vision. You don't have to be smacked upside the head with a bolt of blue and the clouds opening and God writing it in the English language for you to read. He has told you what to do in his word. Now most of those things, those seven different areas of jobs are present in the assignment that Paul, that God gives to Paul and Ananias. Paul was hungry. He was wondering if he would always be blind in his service. I'm sure that went through his mind. Jesus has spoken to him, and Jesus has smitten him blind. And he knows he deserves it. I know that going through his mind was, I wonder if I will always be blind and not really be able to serve Christ like I would like to now. I suspect that Paul also had float through his mind wondering what he would report back to the Pharisees. What about his traveling companions? What he's going to say to them? I know that Ananias was scared out of his sandals just when he thought he had gotten away from persecution. Here it comes to him and God sends him to the persecutor. Imagine the emotions of these men. But God is doing all seven of the things in the lives of these two men that we've just talked about, the seven different areas, to set the stage for an incredible ministry. God gave Ananias a job to develop his character. Quit being a wimp. Quit being a scaredy cat. Get out there and be bold in spite of the fact that there's persecution going on. Two, God gave him a job to accomplish God's purposes, purposes that were unknown to Ananias and Paul. Just a hint to Ananias. Number three, God used Ananias and Saul to prove that he can use the most inadequate instruments for the most incredible ends. Number four, God used Ananias and Saul so that God received the glory, not the men that he used to do the job. God sent Ananias to teach Ananias faith and obedience, how to overcome fear. God forced Ananias to interact with another believer Ananias didn't know that he was a believer. God didn't say, well, he's already trusted Christ. He's saved now, so you're safe. God didn't tell him that. But Saul, with his inner counter with the Lord, becomes a believer on the spot. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He knew that faith resulted in obedience. God forced Ananias to interact with another believer whom he would rather avoid. Later, God used Barnabas for the purpose of introducing Saul, Paul, to the rest of the fearful believers. He didn't use Ananias for that job. Rather interesting. And number seven, God planned a spectacular reward for the man who did the job without questioning and complaining, even the horrendous suffering and persecution that Paul experienced himself. He went and obeyed without complaining. He suffered horrible persecution. But Paul talked about how he was looking forward to receiving the reward which the Lord, the righteous judge, would give it that day, and not to me only, but also unto all them that love his appearing. Another thing that strikes me as I look at this text, it leaps out, is that other, often new believers, often new believers, though incapable at the time of doing anything other than stating the basis of their faith, are more willing to obey then long-time believers. Think of the man born blind in John chapter 9. 
When he is questioned about his faith, he doesn't know much theology, but he does know one thing. Once I was blind, now I see. Put it together. You know, he was bold in his faith. He wasn't cowardly. He knew, I'm sure he knew, because his parents knew, that anybody who confessed that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. But when he's questioned about his faith, he gives a simple testimony. I was blind, now I see. Jesus did it. They ask him over and over again. He says, what, do you want to be his disciples too? He mocks them. He knows who they are. He knows how powerful they are. And he also knows they never did anything for him. And Jesus did. He knows that they're a bunch of hot air. But Jesus has healed him. Now, if you had a choice between the powerful guys with hot air and the Lord Jesus Christ who just healed you, whose side would you be on? Here we find a new believer who is more willing to obey than a man who's been a long-time believer. Saul, ready to obey. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Ananias, ready to argue. Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all the call on thy name. Don't you get it, Lord? This guy's a bad guy. Don't you want to send somebody else? Don't you think there's a better way, like we could write him a note and send it to him? Often people who have been believers for a long time and have experienced just a little taste of persecution or just a little taste of being an outcast and on the outside... They know what happens when you gung-ho jump in to serve the Lord. And they feel uncomfortable with that. So they want to argue with God when they read what God wants them to do in his word. I think most of us fall into that category. Most of us have been believers a long time. We want to run through things in our own grid first rather than obeying first and asking questions later. The problem with that is it's questioning the wisdom of God and deciding that our own wisdom and our own plans are better than his wisdom and plans. Notice this. God gave Ananias specific instructions accompanied by detailed information. Specific instructions and detailed information. First of all, we find the establishment of the authority base. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias... Now, this is at a time before the New Testament scripture is completed. Certainly, none of the epistles of Paul had been written by this point. From the time that he got saved on the road to Damascus and three days blind in the house, he was not writing epistles. You and I have a final authority base also, and that is the Bible. There is the complete revelation of God in scripture. And you and I have it, and we have it in our own language. Ananias got a vision, because the scripture on this subject had not yet been written. We move from the authority base to the initial response before revelation. Here's his initial response. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And you know, that's usually our initial response too, before we learn what we're supposed to do. It's a response that sounds spiritual. But sounding spiritual is not the real proof of our heart condition. There are many people who can sound spiritual. I talked to one on the phone this past week that is anything but spiritual. And that particular person went on and on about Christ and about the Lord and so on. And you just thought, why are you talking this way? Because I know what your life is like. Sounding spiritual is not the issue. The issue is our heart condition. And here is Ananias. He sounds spiritual. Oh, Lord, here I am. Same thing that Isaiah said, except Ananias argues, and Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Just being there, just calling him Lord is not enough. Jesus said in Matthew 7, There are going to be those that say to me, Lord, Lord... And I'm going to say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Using the right words is not enough. It has to be, where is your heart? And then we find the detailed instructions. There are four steps here. Now this is sort of like divine GPS. 
Four steps. The Lord said unto him, number one, arise. That's his current location. You plug in the things on your GPS, and it tells you and it shows you on the screen where you are. Number two, and go into the street, which is called straight. That's the general location. It's getting you to the street you want to be on. Number three, inquire in the house of Judas. There's a specific location. You know, as you're approaching it, it says number three, four, five, such and such a street is on your left. You got your specific location. But it takes you farther than that. It's like a person tracking device. For one, inquire in the house of Judas. For one called Saul of Tarsus. A specific person. So we move from the current location to the general location, the street called Straight, to the specific location of the house of Judas, to the specific person, Saul of Tarsus. God left no room for error here. The divine GPS went into control. Then he gave him detailed information. Again, there are four things in this detailed information. For behold, he prayeth. The very first thing that God tells Ananias is that the man he's looking for is a man who right now and at the time he gets there will be involved in prayer. Are you afraid of someone who's involved in prayer? Who is earnestly petitioning the throne of God? Who is earnestly seeking the face of God? And yet this is a man that Ananias wants to avoid. He's not listening. Instead, he's thinking about Saul of Tarsus, and he doesn't hear another word that God gives to him. For behold, he prayeth. That should have alerted Ananias as to the spiritual condition of Saul. But all Ananias can think about are all the bad things that Saul used to do. He didn't hear. For behold, he prayeth. Second area of information that God gave to him. And has seen a vision. He didn't seem to hear that. After all, that, that is exactly the same means that the Lord was using to speak to Ananias at that point. You had a vision today, Ananias, right? Yeah, yeah, I had a vision. I got to talk to the Lord himself, to the risen Christ. Man, that's exciting. Ananias, are you aware of the fact that Saul has also had a vision? I'm not just talking about the road to Damascus experience. He doesn't even mention the road to Damascus experience. He mentions a vision in which Saul saw Ananias coming into the house and putting his hands on him so that he could receive his sight again. Ananias, you're having a vision right now. Did you know that Saul also had a vision? Ananias doesn't seem to hear that. Number three, a man named Ananias coming in. Saul knew in advance the name of the man who was coming, just like Ananias knew in advance the name of Saul. What amazing information God communicated so that there would be no mistake that this was some kind of a general thing that Ananias missed. He has seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming in. Well, perhaps Ananias thought, well, okay to come in after he heard the rest of this because after all, Saul is blind. But you know, you can come into the house but not get too close to the guy who's in the house because after all, you know, he's a bad guy and he might grab you. You know, a bland guy, if you get close enough and he hears your voice, can reach out there and get you. A man named Ananias. Hey, Ananias, do you know anybody else named Ananias? Have I brought the vision to the wrong Ananias? Is there another Ananias here in Damascus that is supposed to get this vision? God doesn't make mistakes. He knows us by name. He has responsibilities for each of us by name and putting his hand on him now that is not just coming into the house that is close contact and certainly if you put your hand on this blind man he'll know where your hand is and if he's fast he can grab it 
that he might receive his sight. Ananias, I have a job for you that is beneficial. You might look at it as a scary job. You might not want to do it. But if God assigns it, it will be beneficial. That he might receive his sight. You will know exactly who this is. And here is the specific purpose for the job. Did God give Ananias enough information whereby Ananias could have said with joy in his heart, Yes, Lord, that's an exciting opportunity. What a blessing it is that you've given me this opportunity. No, he did not. You know, our authority today is the Bible, but what is our initial response? Well, normally we say, Oh, I'm happy to do the will of God. Sure, okay. That's fine as long as it doesn't go against my preconceived notions of what God wants me to do. Yes, there is an authority base just like there was here. Number two, what are our detailed instructions? Remember, there were detailed instructions that were being given. Now, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to ask you if you have a piece of paper and a pencil. And if not, I want you to think because I'm not going to give you the answers. Take out a piece of paper and a pencil. We're on the point, what are our detailed instructions? Stop and write down three specific commands from the Bible that immediately come to your mind. The first three things that come to your mind, three specific commands from the Bible that come to your mind. It can be all, I mean, there are thousands of commands in Scripture. Write down the first three that come to your mind. I'm going to wait here for a minute while you do that. What are the first three commands in the Bible that come to your mind? Or the first three prohibitions? First three things that come to your mind. We're on the point dealing with detailed instructions. Doesn't matter what three you write down, I suspect if we all compared papers at this point, we would have three different things written down for every one of us. There might be one or two overlaps, but there will be a, probably a lot of things that are not overlapped. Your three would not be the same three as my three. What are the first three things that come to your mind? Detailed instructions. Now, if you couldn't think of anything, probably one of the following things is true of you. Number one, you're not a believer. Quite possible. Might be someone here who is not truly saved. So you don't know the Bible and you don't care what the Bible says. You're going through motions just to make yourself look good. That's one possibility. Number two, if you couldn't think of anything to write down, perhaps you're a believer, but you have not been walking in fellowship with the Lord. Because the Lord always gives us direction from his word, and so there will be things that have been flowing through you as you have been studying the word of God and as you've been praying. There will be detailed instructions that you have become aware of, certainly over this last week. But if you've not been walking in fellowship with the Lord, three things didn't immediately pop into your mind. Number three... If nothing came to you, perhaps you have not been studying the scripture. You see, that's where God gives us his direction today, is with the word of God. And if you're not having an intake of the word of God, you won't know what you're supposed to do. Let me illustrate. Yesterday, we got a new phone for the kitchen. And... Um, I knew how to put the phone up on the wall, not a problem. But it came with this little skinny booklet of about 30 or 40 pages of all the detailed instructions of what you're supposed to do to get various things to work on the phone. Well, hey, this is not my area. I didn't bother to read the book. I gave it to Megaly. <laughs> Megaly is our techno wonk in the house. And she's the one that reads instructions on things like that and then knows how to do all the silly things that have to be done to make it do whatever it's supposed to do. 
You know, I am going to certainly miss her when she goes away to college. <laughs> I won't have a techno wonk in the house anymore to help me when the computer suddenly freezes up and I don't know what to do next. But you know, I don't know what three things I should do in relation to the phone. Why? Because I didn't read the manual. And if you have not been studying the scripture, you will know nothing about what God wants you to do. Because he has revealed his specific will in the Bible. Next. If you didn't have three things come to your mind, perhaps you have been ignoring what you read. I know we're on the Read Through the Bible in a Year program here at the church. And at the end of the year, we have many who turn in a sheet to Mrs. Whitbeck, and then she makes these beautiful certificates having read through the Bible in a year. And some have read through the Bible more than once in a year. But you know there's a difference of reading through the Bible and letting the Bible read through you. We can go over the words and we mindlessly do that, and I have done this many times myself where I've begun a passage and I have a regular systematic time for studying scripture every morning where I read at least four different chapters, two out of the Old Testament, two out of the New Testament, so that I always have a mix of different chapters as I read through New Testament and Old Testament simultaneously. So God gives me many different insights by doing that because suddenly I see something in the Old Testament that's also in the New Testament and then I jot notes in the margins of my Bible which is scribbled through with, with notes. I can never get rid of Bibles because you know, even though they wear out, they've got all these notes that I thought were great at the time that I've written in the margins. But often, I'll have something troubling on my mind and as I'm reading through, my mind begins to wander to that thing. My eyes are going over the Word but my spirit is not interacting with the Word of God. I'm simply reading words. If you couldn't think of three things that God has given you as a detailed instruction in his word, perhaps you've been ignoring what you read. And finally, you've read what God wants you to do, you've understood what God wants you to do, but you're a believer who is filled with fear rather than with faith. Certainly we find many of these things in our text tonight. That was the detailed instructions, just like we see detailed instructions being given to Ananias here. And finally, as with Ananias, what detailed information do you have about those three simple areas of command? God has given us detailed information in relation to every command and every prohibition that he has set forth in the word of God. He has given us articulate reasons for these things. He has given us articulate results of what we will do, what will happen if we obey and what will happen if we disobey. Detailed information about the commands that he has given to us. It will all be found in the Bible. Are you searching the scripture daily so that you will know the specific will of God? I hope you remember our studies on the will of God. We talked about it both in the morning worship service and in the evening services, and we spent extensive time on how to know the will of God for your life. And it comes with, first of all, studying scripture. As you study scripture, there are questions that you have to ask yourself so that you will know the will of God because he's revealed his will in his word. There are a series of questions that you have to ask and answer. But dear friends, I'm not going to repeat those steps here. I'll give you the first one. Is it commanded in the Bible? If it's commanded, you have no options. Your only response must be obedience. And you obviously can figure out the second one. Is it prohibited by scripture? But for the rest of those, I encourage you, dig out your notes. Begin the Ananias and Paul process. And be ready to obey, not ready to argue. 
Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power and for the illustrations of real people living in real time with real emotions and real souls and spirits and bodies and real minds and how you dealt with them. Father, help us to be willing to obey, not willing to argue. Help us to search the scriptures for your will. Perhaps the three things that you brought to our mind as we went through this little exercise tonight are the three things that you want us to focus on right now. Not to forget, not to ignore, but to search the scriptures on those things and then to give us the courage to obey. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it has gone forth tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.